these are very important observations and an order passed by the Supreme Court on the functioning of the Election Commission of India and the selection of the election commissioners and indeed the chief election uh, commissioner. Um, and the point being made by the election by the Supreme Court is that the EC will now be appointed by the Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition and the Chief Justice uh, of India. There's also been an important uh, order which was passed uh, yesterday by the Supreme Court uh, on a, the need for an investigation monitored by the court on the allegations against the Adani. So we're going to be talking about that as well. We've got a very special guest, Harish Salve, with us. Uh, thanks, Mr. Salve, very much for being with us. Let's talk first about the uh, unanimous verdict of the Supreme Court as far as the Election Commission is concerned. I'll just read out a couple of, uh, of quotes, one or two quotes, and get your reaction. A party in power will have an insatiable quest to remain in power through a servile commission. Is it your concern that the election commission, as it stands now, is servile to the government? I think that sentence was completely unnecessary in a judgment, which otherwise has the reasoning of which is compelling. Let's raise, raise the debate to a, a philosophical level all over the world, including in the United Kingdom, which is the oldest democracy with the maximum discretion, as it were, in government. Everything has now been institutionalized, be it the appointment of judges in this country, even the selection of lawyers as what in India, the senior advocates, we call them now King's Council, is institutionalized. There is so the reason that you should now in today's day and age have an institutional mechanism for the appointment of the chief election commissioner is compelling. Whether uh, all parties in power have an insatiable quest to either remain in power or to come in power. So that's, that's neither here nor there. That's, that's the nature of the animal. Right. That's what politics is all about. I think the more compelling reason is today the, demo the, the democracy is based on legitimacy of government. And legitimacy of government is imparted by a public perception of free and fair elections. So to impart this legitimacy to government, you must have an election commission who, like Caesar's wife, is above suspicion. So Mr. And Salve, that is why institutionalism. Here's another point. The court said a person who is in a state of obligation or is indebted to whom appointed him fails the nation and can have no place in the process of election, which forms the very foundation of democracy. Now, this is true. Uh, the, the, found, the election commission is dependent on the government for funding. Uh, the, the process of selection is done by the government. Uh, and, and therefore, I mean, should there not be more transparency and more independence as far as the EC selection is concerned? Vishnu, I'm saying you don't need to get down to this level. I'm saying conceptually, there is clearly a need in today's day and age to institutionalize the process of appointment of the election commissioner, mm -hmm. of the election commission per se, and not just the chief election commission. Because this is one of the most, the election commission is no less important in legitimizing our democracy than the Supreme Court of India. And if we have independent appointment of Supreme Court judges, and that is why I'm one of the trenchant critics of the collegium system, we must have some independent mechanism for appointment of the CEC. We have to have either institutional appointments or electoral appointments. Parliament is appointed by election. State assemblies are appointed by election. Institutions are appointed by nomination. Nomination has to be institutionalized. That is the that reason, that part of the reasoning of the judgment is compelling. All the reform commissions have said so, and that has to be done. All these observations that Supreme Court has made is not pointing a finger as is being suggested. It's just a, a, a reason why over the years we have come to accepting the principle that appointments of offices like this have to be institutionalized. What worries me is when this is done in a court proceeding without adequate public consultation and without a full debate on the subject, you come up with certain solutions which are imperfect. What worries me is the solution. I, I hope it doesn't create a remedy which is worse than the disease. 
the appointment is not unanimous. If you make the appointment unanimous, knowing today's fractured polity, you will never get an appointment. Right. If you do not make the appointment unanimous, then it's going to be the Chief Justice of India who's going to be appointing the Chief Election Commissioner. Hmm. You know, there is a part of the judgment, sir, which says that uh, the guidelines laid down by the Supreme Court yesterday will continue to exist until such time as this is debated in Parliament. Um, See, do you believe that that's that, almost know, inevitable? But these guy, but that is uh, these guidelines. I find the the implications of these guidelines. We have lived without it for so many decades. They could have said we should have a public debate and get this issue resolved. Failing which, the Supreme Court will have no choice but to judicially review each and every appointment. That threat may have worked. Right. To put in process a motion. Otherwise, the court would have said, we are going to send for every file and check it on the, and have a look at it on the judicial side, whether all relevant factors have been considered. So that becomes a, 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 a threat to the government saying, either you put in place a mechanism or your decisions are vulnerable. The solution which the court has found and put the Chief Justice of India in a very unenviable position. The Prime Minister will suggest a name. Knowing today's fractured polity, the chances are the leader of the opposition will say no. Why? Just because the Prime Minister has suggested it. So it's left to the Chief Justice to say yea or nay. And that puts the Chief Justice of India in a very unenviable position. Because if he says yes, one group will think he is good and one group will say he is aligning with the other side. If he says no, the converse proposition will flow. Because you've seen that happen in judgments. Look at look at the kind of language Udav Thakre has used for the, uh, with the election commission. Yes. We have lost respect yes. for all institutions. Right. We have today lawyers who come and say that the judiciary has become subservient to the executive. Why? Because some of the judgments have gone in favor of the government. So we today have lost all respect for all institutions. In today's mood, you're putting the Chief Justice of India in this unenviable position of being the man who's going to be selecting the election commissioners. And what happens if an election commissioner, you should have heard one of the lawyers recently has given a speech saying that because of the collegium system, all the bad judges who, who are compromised are all thanks to the Supreme Court of India. You, you get the stigma on your head. Now you're going to have, if you have a bad, if you have an election commission commissioner with whom you're not happy, We'll say the same thing about no, so I, I get that, sir. But let me ask you this. Do you not uh, accept that there are problems in the election commission? Yes, there have been allegations used by the Shiv Sena. You may or may not agree with what they're saying. Uh, the sudden election, selection of the chief election commissioner, something that's been questioned. Apparently, it took place overnight. We had an election commissioner, Mr. Lavasa, in the past uh, who said that, look, you know, there are dissent notes over here. Make my dissent notes public. That didn't take place as well. These are three examples which come to the top of my head. Uh, are they representative of a problem that needs to be fixed? Yes, there is a problem. Let's let's not uh, let's not beat around the bush. There is a problem in the manner in which the election commission has been functioning. For the last three or four appointments, there have been controversies raised by one side or the other, which only underscores the need for having institutional appointments. Yeah. So on that, there can be no no cavil whatsoever. The problem is twofold. When the court sets about putting a mechanism in place and puts the Chief Justice on top, like it has done just now. I think it just might be a remedy worse than the disease. Got it. Because now what you're doing is, we have, we have lost respect for institutions. And what I was saying is the Election Commission may have got the Shiv Sena order right or it may have got it hopelessly wrong. You have, you have a remedy in judicial review. But we do not use this kind of vocabulary for constitutional institutions. We have lost all sense of control over our vocabulary. And putting the Chief Justice of India in a situation like this, I think, is doing, doing him a disservice. You're putting him in a very difficult position by this kind of a situation. I think it is having, well, now that the Supreme Court has said institutionalize it, I think the government of India should immediately set up a, a committee of eminent people familiar with the subject who will debate this and come up with a proper formula, like an like a, a appointments commission. One final purpose. question on this before I, you know, I get to what the Supreme Court actually had to say as far as the Adani case uh, is concerned. The allegations against the Adani's are concerned. 
um, there was this very interesting, you know, there, there were many references to democracy as far as what the election, uh, the Supreme Court yesterday had to say. And there was a linkage uh, which actually took place to the state of the media in the country. So let me link two statements. I don't think I'd be uh, sort of inaccurate in doing that. Democracy can su succeed only if all stakeholders work on it to maintain the purity of the election process. And then a little later, a little later, right, not the next sentence, a little later, they said a large section of the media has abdicated its role and become partisan. In other, I mean, the, the media is obviously a part of our democratic system. That, that's what it's meant to be. But this is also a very strong reference to what we become. See, today, that's what I'm telling you. Today, the, and it's not just in India. You look at, you look at the older democracy. Look, look at the United States. Look at U United Kingdom, the two, two examples which we know. Here also people say, if, if you read the Guardian, if you read the Times, they, it goes one way. If you read the Telegraph, it goes one way. If you read some other newspaper, it goes the other way. In New York, at, the, at Trump's time, you know the, the divide in the electronic media. You had the CNN and the uh, one channel versus the Fox News and, and the sharp divide and the us and them. The whole notion of us and them started in America initially. So these kind of allegations will always be made in today's day and age where we have lost faith in the independence of institutions and I'm not saying the cynicism is uncalled for, cynicism is called for. Sure. But partly I also say that India is going through a huge transition. Yes. India is going through a huge transition in the kind of people who are governing India. A lot of West, a lot of established interests, I don't like the word vested interests, a lot of established interests have find themselves displaced. A lot of thinking is changing and a democracy must have the flexibility to adapt itself to all kinds of thinking. Yeah. And we have in India to reinvent ourselves and adapt ourselves to yeah. this new kind of thinking. Right. So in this, th these kind of stresses and strains and tensions were bound to be seen. And I think the judgment broadly is in the right direction saying we must have institutional appointment. But I wish Parliament now does it immediately rather than leave our Chief Justice holding the baby like this. Let's just move on now to uh, the other important um, uh, sort of order that was passed by the Supreme Court yesterday as far as all of the allegations against the Adani group are concerned. Um, obviously, it's being done to protect the common citizen in the country. Um, it's also important to strengthen our various institutions. Firstly, the choice of people. It's headed by Justice Abe Manohar Sapre. Uh, people like Justice J.P. Devadhar, K.V. Kamat, Nandan Nilikani, Somshekhar Sundareshan and O.P. Bhatt. These are all very credible individuals. Do you believe that this is the right way uh, to address the allegations as opposed to a JPC in Parliament? Of course, see, a JPC in Parliament consists of members of Parliament. They are, they are very wise people. Here what has happened is an area in a very specialized field. What has, ha what has happened here is that there are allegations made about structuring of companies, allegations made about how shares have been issued, how shares have been overvalued, how the market has been played. This is a very specialized field. Justice Sapre brings experience. He's been a commercial lawyer. I've had the privilege of working with him as a lawyer. I've had the privilege of appearing before him. I see. Devdar used to be a Bombay High Court judge. He comes from the chamber of Mr. Danuka. He was a tax lawyer. We worked together. We appeared against each other. I've appeared before him. And then he was in the SAT. So he knows the subject backwards. Uh, Som, uh, Somashankar, uh, Som is uh, a top barrister, uh, top lawyer in Bombay. We have done so many cases together. He knows this law better than most lawyers do. He can teach me this law. He is that good. Now you have people like this who will look at what is going on in the market and what exactly has happened. And you will have their report if after which if the report convinces you that there has been a political cover-up or a political this, then you should demand uh, uh, action in parliament, debate in parliament, joint parliamentary committee. Today the demand for joint parliamentary committee is only to embarrass the government. And these noises will become more shrill as 2024 comes closer. <laughs> you know that, I know that. Mr. Salve, so, let's look at the, the terms of reference because I think this is also equally important. To suggest measures to strengthen market regulatory and statutory frameworks. So going beyond 
the immediate allegations to also look at how the larger sort of structure needs to be strengthened, to assess factors that led to market volatility recently, to examine measures to strengthen investor awareness. How important is this point? Investor awareness. It's very important. To investigate whether there's been one, one or two more points, to investigate whether there's been a regulatory failure and to investigate allegations of stock market manipulation, the committee must submit a sealed report within two months. Again, time bound. This now, cannot go on forever. Yeah, go ahead. So, so, so I have always said there are two things. One is the allegations being made by Hindenburg report. They may be right, they may be wrong. I, Adani is my client, you know that. We will defend the allegations, etc., etc. But there is a completely another different dimension to this. Hindenburg is no good Samaritan who has exposed wrongdoing. They have timed the report, they have dropped the report, they do it for shorty. It is my suggestion, and I have said so in publicly, and I am repeating that. The company, the committee must find out all those who have made tons of money at the cost of the middle class investor by shorting shares. Treat that as market manipulation and get them to disgorge and ban them from trading. So we must set a tone in our market. That first of all, if there is a report, it must go to the SEBI, it must go to the Serious Fraud Office, it must go to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, they will investigate and deal with such matters. But if you are going to use reports like this to attack companies, the SEBI will not sit quiet. They will go after the people who are exploiting market volatility, by who have money bags, who are exploiting volatility, hitting the middle class investor. Because India is new in this game. We are growing our capital markets. We, if the middle class investor is petrified that every time he lists in a company, tomorrow there is the Hindenburg report, by the time it is proved to be false, it's too late. Hmm. Your shares have tanked anyway. Hmm. We must have some institutional mechanism to say the people who are systematically making money on this misfortune of the middle class shareholder are held to account. The fact that this needs to be... Uh time bound that's also important i mean this if this goes on critical. for a year then it just it's destroys the purpose it is critical because investor confidence is fragile today whether true or false the fact is the the investor sentiment is damaged by such occurrences of market volatility and i think to build it back we need to know and we need to know quickly what exactly happened. All right, uh, Mr. Salve, wonderful speaking to you. Yesterday was quite a day, wasn't it? Northeast elections and then these two very important uh, Supreme Court judgments, not to mention G20. It was one heck of a news day in India. Thank heck you very much day. for speaking to us. Thanks very much yeah. indeed.